Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we are continuing with volume number three of VFDs installed incorrectly. Now, I have removed the HY from the title because HY is simply the manufacturer brand of the VFD. And in this case, it's not an HY VFD. It's irrelevant. All of the principles are the same. But once again, we have a vendor, and yes, I said that right, a vendor of CNC components who I've done videos on in the past that now crossed over and wanted to display what he understands about working with VFDs and spindles. Let's jump right in. Ah, our first disclaimer of the CNC fail series. This is interesting. Let's read it together. High voltage is being used to set up the VFD and spindle. Please seek a professional electrician to connect and set up the VFD and spindle. This video is created for educational purposes only. Now I'm going to ask everyone in my audience a question. How can anyone provide a video for educational purposes only if the video is incorrect in the education it's providing? It's a good question. I mean, what's the purpose of saying that the video is for education if the information is misinformation? Let's think of something else. Realistically, guys, I'm going to tell you the truth. An electrician on most cases is not going to understand how to set up a VFD. He will know how to connect a VFD, but most likely will not understand how to program it and this is a very, very common issue when you work with these units because, again, electricians are not usually trained in dealing with commercial-grade VFDs. It just doesn't happen. So keep that in mind before you jump into this genre. That's a fact. Now, that being said, let's jump in and see exactly what education he is providing. Inside you'll see that there is a N220 and L. The N is for neutral and the L is for live. I want you guys to pay close attention to what I'm zooming in here where he specified that N is neutral and L is live. Reviewing the terminal block that we see here, that's impossible that that would be neutral if you're to supply two power legs, meaning two leads to supply 220 volt. In order to do that, you'd have one lead at 110, another lead at 110, and that would supply 220. If you notice, there's UVW there to the right, and those leads signify connections for the three-phase power cable going to the spindle. Therefore, that is not a neutral lead that would go into there. It is another power lead, once again, to supply 220 volts to this VFD. To power the VFD, I use a standard extension cord. The one I have, I think, is 16 gauge. Once again, we see redundancy in the pattern of the content creator. What's more important, and I'm going to point this out throughout the video, is this is a vendor of these components, which means, in theory, he should have a much higher education of what he's selling. Well, Using a standard extension cord or a standard power cord to power the VFD, once again, is not best practice because why? VFDs emit the largest amount of electromagnetic interference, aka EMI, and it's really interesting if you listen carefully to the amount of detail he's providing where he states that he thinks the cable he's using is 16 gauge. Now, I'm going to ask you again, if you're providing a video for educational purposes only, shouldn't you be definitive on the selection of components? You shouldn't be just guessing what you're using. Not to mention, I'm sure it's on that package he has from Monoprice. I will cut off the female end because this will not be able to plug into the wall, obviously. We'll need to. All right, here's where things get interesting. I'm going to zoom in on this plug very carefully and I want you guys to understand you're looking at a NEMA 5-15P plug. This plug is able to safely carry 125 volts maximum. It is not made for a 220 volt single phase application known as the VFD he is going to be connecting to it.
Now, many of you may not believe this. I know every now and then I have a hater. So let me clarify for them because sometimes they need a little more reassurance. Here's an open Google search reflecting the same thing. Now, once again, this is a AKA vendor and he is claiming to understand these components and that's why he's doing this so-called educational video. And what's really disturbing about this, I'm doing these corrective videos and I'm setting the record straight on what's fact and fiction. And then this guy makes more money than me on YouTube. I've given you a tiny bit of knowledge because I'm doing this for peanuts. Which is really interesting to put this amount of effort doing these types of videos defining what is real and what isn't. And I want you guys to think if I save one person by, God forbid, either injuring themselves or burning down their house, what is this video worth? Now combine that with all the other videos. And when guys say, well, why do you charge what you do? That's why I charge what I do because I pay attention to the details. So when people contact me, they don't have to, they can reassure themselves that I've done my homework. This is a disgrace. It should have never made YouTube. And I hope in the future, they will become more prone to using their AI sources to protect what is being done by these end users. Keep this end because this one plugs into the wall. And I'll cut it right here. So I've exposed the wires. I remove approximately half an inch or three eighths of an inch of the insulation off of each conduit. And now so here we go again with the following pattern being implemented by the content creator slash vendor in that he's installing fork connectors to integrate into the VFD's power terminal block, which is a definitive no-no for safety. I've discussed that before in previous videos. I'll bring that up again. You can see exactly why. And it could also lead to a, uh, a failure and that could be catastrophic. Another question I was just asked is why do I use ring connectors instead of fork connectors? Well, many of you already know that answer. Ring connectors do not pull out. These, once they're attached, the screw goes through the center and if I went to pull this out, I'm, I'm literally going to have to destroy each lead because these are done with solder and flux. Again, solder, Kester number 44. The flux is Kester 186 RMA. It's the best in the industry. And that is the proper way to do these cables so that, once again, we have proper safety implemented. Okay? So now I'm going to get ready to boot the cable. But again, showing you this in a dissected format, doing a kind of uh, cable autopsy, you can see exactly what we have here. And the main reason I cover redundancy in my videos, many guys have said that to me before, is that I don't know what viewer is going to stumble upon this video. Is he new? Has he seen my previous videos? This way, everyone's on the same page. And again, guys, reiterating the same point and showing you that I'm consistent in what I do shows not only best practice, but shows that I'm factual. Okay. Most of the time when you don't know what you're doing, you lack consistency. It's a word we seldom see and a word that is so powerful when it comes to understanding the genre you're working with. This right here defines, once again, no thought has been implemented to, once again, provide safety for whoever is educationally watching this video. So again, it's definitely worth mentioning. The spindle will come with a connector for the back of the spindle, and it is the female part of the connector. And to separate the connector, or to get to the insides of the connector, you just screw this off. You can remove this. Make sure to put this back before you put this section back on. And then you have at the back here, this is a strain relief. So when you put the cable in here, you'll screw down these two screws, and it'll provide some, some locking for the cable so the cable can't be pulled out. Okay, for my new guys getting involved in the genre, keep in mind that whatever spindle you select will have its own spindle connector and each one does have its own level of difficulty to install. That being said, the one that he's highlighting being used here is known as the H17, which requires the most amount of labor to install if you're using the proper cable because the housing on this connector is usually too small to utilize the proper 16 gauge double shielded cable. Very easily. And the posts on this connector are little cups that you'll need to use for soldering. Let's be very clear here, guys. In order to solder these cups, you will require solder, 
recommended Kestrin number 44, and Flux recommended Kestrin 186 RMA no clean flux. These are required. It's mandatory, no exceptions. The U terminal here is wired to the number three terminal on the connector. The number three terminal is located right here, opposite the little notch on the side. Number one pin is here, number two pin is here, and number three pin is here and U is connected to the number three pin. Number one is connected to the V terminal and the number two pin is connected to the W terminal. Let's be very clear, gentlemen, that on any of your spindle connectors that are four pin and they are HY, you are going to find that on three of the pins, they are hot leads. On the fourth pin, meaning the fourth pin terminal that is numbered four is for your ground. You cannot mix up your power leads on the remaining three because they are all power leads in order to provide three phase power for your spindle motor. So him going over what connector position is for what lead dealing with what power is going to the spindle is irrelevant. So the only lead you have to be concerned with hooking up correctly is of course the ground. That is it. The remaining leads, pins number one, pin number two, pin number three, are all hot. Does not matter what order you hook them up because, once again, they are all providing a power leg to your spindle cable. The connector has small cups to apply solder. So what I generally do is I just apply some solder here because it, it also applies some flux. So once again, I'm sure many of you realize that there really isn't anything educational in this video that this vendor is providing. Um, you should never be assuming that the amount of flux within a flux core solder roll is enough to help tin your terminals on any connector. That amount of flux within that roll is simply designed to help clean your soldering tip. It's a very, very minute amount of flux. These guys that keep telling you you can just use the solder rolls flux to do regular soldering is completely false, misinformation, whatever you want to call it. Lack of education is what I call it. And once again, it's something that really, really needs to be stopped because it's an issue with leading to safety issues with compromised connections. That being said, I've said it before earlier in the video, all connections require you using the proper flux and that means you buying the bottle of flux and applying it separately because you need that flux to once again provide proper bonding strength wetting and flow of the solder that is what it's used for that is the proper way to formulate a bond when using soldering then i'll tin the other piece of the wire the the exposed portion of the wire, then I'll just touch the two and heat the both together and they'll fuse together. What we generally do. So we heard the vendor discuss in relatively great detail about his soldering process. Yet, as we watched the video, and no, I did not skip ahead, we are assuming he's going to show his lead solder to the connector. What we actually find is that he shows you the connector with the leads having heat shrunk over them already attached to it. Now, how logical is that, guys? Think about what I'm asking you. If I'm covering a process, the next logical thing would be for me to show you the lead soldered to the connector or me showing you uh, myself soldering the leads to the connector as I've done in many videos. When you see the picture in this video, after we go over to it, for this cable, you will see why I charge what I do because you haven't seen the internal structure of this cable. Okay, guys, I just wanted to clarify something. This is the H17 connector. You can see that here. You can see the connections are all done. This cable is just going to be closed up. Um, I'm going to cut over to a picture that was sent to me. And this person explained to me they didn't understand why I charge what I do. And if you look at this picture of what they sent me and you see this, I think now we can determine why I charge what I do. This, take, this has taken me years to get this good. And again, I, I let the work reflect what I know. And you can see exactly what we've got here. We've got no overflow. Everything is set. Ground is set on the bottom. All your shield is removed. Everything here is nice and clean. And everything, of course, as far as the shield, uh, both shields, the drain, or excuse me, the drain, 
the foil and the tin braided copper are all uh, beneath the casing as they should be and you can see the finished 817. I'll show you the cable when it's completed. But once again, talk is cheap. When you see the work done and you can do this and do it repeatedly, I feel then you've earned what you've asked and you can see exactly what we've got here. Okay, you've seen the finished structure. This should be a giant red flag. When we see this, it usually means that once again, he's not proud of his work. And why wouldn't he be proud of his work? Well, of course, he's not using flux. We already know that. So look at where all the details lie. You can see a pattern. And I've said this before. If you watch a content creator's video nine out of 10 times in this genre, you will see skipping around in areas usually where the content creator is the weakest. This way, again, it doesn't draw as much attention to those areas for their audience. This is fact. Let's see where this goes. Is we'll add some heat shrink, and on each wire we'll also add heat shrink so we can further separate and insulate the wires when they're installed. I hand it to many content creators who like to spread the BS as deep as possible when instead of them saying I did the best I could, they try to come up with different ways of reflecting that they did something correctly when all it does is reflect more incompetence on the subject. One would only install heat shrink that far back on this connector where it's exceeding the strain relief of the connector due to the fact that they are not used to working with this type of cable so they had to skin it all the way back and then he feels that he'll explain that away by telling his audience that i'm going to insulate each individual lead that is absolutely not required and in factual sense if you were to try to do that where you skin the cable correctly leaving the appropriate amount of casing be present so that it makes contact with the stress relief, you would notice that it's impossible to insulate each lead individually, nor is it required. And why is that? Because when you screw that connector's casing together, you will find that it's going to insulate those leads as a single unit because they are attached to the connector. And you can see that in this video here where I've insulated them as a unit and then of course using double heat shrink and once again closing up the connector would be the next following process. Hey guys, it's Vince and I'm on the workbench and I'm knocking out a DS flexion spindle cable. I've got a lot of questions about this. This is the way a connector is supposed to look. When once again we're using the proper solder and flux you can see what we have here. We've got just a little over a quarter of an inch of spacing. You can see our conductors are how everything is placed. And again, you see no exposed leads at all from the casing, okay? When we rotate the cable, the pockets are perfect. You can see there's no bleed through. Everything there is set. Now, I got asked a very good question about, well, I never see you close up the cable. Well, you're going to see me close up the cable right now. And this is using double wall heat shrink. Now, if you get good at this, and I mean really good, you'll find that you can cut the heat shrink perfectly to where this will meet up with the cable and that will give you the finishing touch so to speak now again working with double wall heat shrink is uh, a little bit of practice because again you want to get it shrink to the proper percentage so that you'll get the effect you want you can see how i'm going through the hy connector as far as uh, the actual back cup now what i'm going to do is i'm going to come in with the precision heat gun and I'm just going to hit this once it reaches temperature. I'm going to start shrinking it from the bottom. And you'll see it start creeping in. And there we go. Now we'll start creeping in. Now we do have the activated uh, adhesive. So as I do this, we're going to be pushing up to give us the proper effect that we're looking for. Fingerprints and all that will come out as soon as we heat the unit. Just keep moving very slightly as we as we heat. 
working it little by little. And patience is a virtue here. Do not use a ham fist uh, for my guys out there in aviation. You want a nice soft touch. And again, some guys ask me, you know, why, why does the cable cost so much? How come you charge so much for labor? Because I'm not afraid to show you under the hood. I'm going to show you the way a cable should be done. I would expect it done at a professional level with the UL rating in terms of the cable being used and it's double shielded. And what you see here is that base is totally sealed. Now what I'm going to do is switch over to a high heat gun. You can see we're just about there now. Four hundred and fifty degrees on this. Give me the proper shrink ratio. You got it. And you'll see once you get this nice and hot. That's what you're left with, right there. That is hot. But you can see that seal goes all the way across the cable. And that's what you're paying for. Because, guys, you can't measure this. This is practice. Hours, years of practice. Thousands of cables. That's how you do that. That's what everybody expects. That's usually what you don't see on YouTube. Because this takes years of practice. And when I say that, I'm not doing this in a quick assembly. These cables, even just doing this end, typically takes me, oh, 50 minutes or so to do, which guys say, wow, that's fast, after how many years? <laughs> and I still screw up. I'm not perfect all the time, but you can see here what this cable is supposed to look like. We've got our bead of adhesive around here, so again, it seals the cable, and you can see the edge of the cable is absolutely perfect. Your seating is perfect. And that's the way she looks. Then, of course, when we uh, screw on the actual casing of the spindle connector, you're all set. When you use heat shrink in the manner you see here, where it's going past the strain relief, you are using way too thin a material. As a matter of fact, you can see the conductors, meaning the leads, going through the heat shrink. And over time, just from that cable's age and flexibility, because again, it is a live cable moving with the axis of the system, it will lead to deterioration and most likely fracturing of the internal conductors. This is fact. This, once again, is not educational. It's a load of BS and certainly not best practice. I'm going to connect the spindle connector, which is the UVW terminals, to the back of the spindle. And you have this ring here that will screw onto the back. Before you run the spindle for a, an extended amount of time, make sure... That this still illustration is one that really needs to be reviewed in close detail. First and foremost, as I've already identified, you can see that the cable's casing has been removed in far excess of where the spindle connector's stress relief is. In doing so, I've already identified that the stress relief, when it's compressed on the heat shrink, which is far too thin to hold up to duration as far as that cable being flexed back and forth when it's in motion on the CNC robot for the X and Y axis, you will also see that there is a bulge of where the leads are within the heat shrink reflecting that those leads are twisted. Now, what that twist means is that those leads are soldered under tension and once again, you have a recipe for disaster over time. This is why the cable's casing should never be removed this far back because it also prevents that twisting effect that you see there. Whether he did it intentionally or not, when you go to screw this connector on or go to place it on the spindle, it's virtually impossible to have those leads when the casing has been removed that far back in perfect symmetry, meaning it's not going to be a twisted cable either fore or aft when you go to apply that connector to the spindle. So this is an area of detail that can certainly cause a lot of issues with number one, safety, and number two, duration of durability. So guys, be very careful of what you're looking at. Since I only have a 110 outlet at this location, 
doing the video. I'm going to use a transformer, a step-up transformer. In best practice, gentlemen, you should never be using a step-up transformer with a VFD. The frequencies can have inconsistent results. You can Google that yourself. Look up all of the different problems associated with anyone trying to do this. It's definitely not recommended. Always get the proper wall outlet voltage and select the proper VFD. Now they have 110 and 220 volt units available so that it's much easier to source one. And the other thing to keep in mind, once again, is he is using the incorrect plug slash cable with the VFD. You can see the outlet that he's pointing to that says output 220 on the STU-300 step-up transformer he's using. And it appears that that plug will plug into that port. Unfortunately, it's very similar to the NEMA 6-50R and 6-50P, which is identified on the chart I'm providing as well as showing that it reflects it uses 250 volts. This is how details bite the unexpected or the people that don't do research. In this case, he doesn't have the knowledge of the correct plug, so he thought he would use whatever plug fit into the slot and unfortunately doesn't realize he's putting himself and his audience at risk, regardless of, once again, he's providing a video for strictly educational purposes, if you can buy that. All right, guys, that wraps up this edition of DFDs Installed Incorrectly. And I had a 30-foot plug spindle cable order come in last night. Many of you don't realize that assembling one of these cables may be out of your budget to do a full assembly. The plug cable version only has the uh, spindle plug on it, meaning the spindle's female connector for power installed, and then the end user will install the ring connectors for VFD integration. Um, again, that will save you some time uh, as far as the installation, and of course, save you money as far as labor and installation on that end. So these are things to keep in mind if you are okay with doing open soldering and when close quarter soldering becomes more of a hassle, this will definitely be your best friend and an option to think about. Now also keep in mind everything you just saw in that video. Uh, I've covered it in great detail. This was one of the worst videos I've seen as far as covering the details from a content creator actually posting a video dealing with a build. And you can see here, once again, this is a large HY connector. We have a double wall heat shrink with double wall heat shrink over it. So you can see here where it comes in. And then of course it wraps where that double wall heat shrink ends and comes all the way up and extends past that uh, seam. And the main reason I do that, because I've gotten asked about that before, is due to the fact that we wanna make sure that we come past, but we want this area to be much stronger because of flexing. And I do that where it engages the spindle. Over here, typically it'll be installed in a vertical fashion like this. And in this way, this keeps that end of the cable as firm as possible. And then over here, where it goes inside the stress relief, the cable circumference has been increased by using two layers of double wall heat shrink. So this is basically impermeable. We've got uh, blue Loctite used on all of our screws, including the set screw on the bottom. So this is all set to go. And the icing on the cake, of course, is using the Oxid Gold on our conductors. So everything here is done. Every base has been covered. Fluke 179 True RMS Multimeter used to actually configure and make sure that continuity is on all of the leads. We have no, no uh, integration problems as far as flexing issues and whatnot. And it gets mailed out to the client. So... Again, I hope that this has enlightened you. I hope you guys are learning from these videos. And once again, I want to thank everybody for their support. I'll keep the videos coming. Thank you.